Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Philip Osteen, Dean of the University of Utah College of Social Work, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. This is our final Grand Challenges for Social Work Lecture Series for the academic year. And I want to thank you for making time to join us here in person for those of you who are also online and those of you who are even watching this after the fact. Before we begin, just one brief housekeeping note. So if you're here in person and you are wanting CEU credits, please make sure you sign in and out at the contact table over there to make sure that we get those. For those of you who are watching online, you'll get a link to the recording and a brief quiz here in the next couple of days. So make sure you do that and then we'll make sure you get your CEU hours. I'd also like to acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the endearing relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach. Today, we are deeply honored to welcome Dr. Halavalu Vakalahi, a Pacific Islander American woman who was born in Tonga and raised in Hawaii. She is the president and CEO of the Council on Social Work Education, which we also call CSWE. The council's vision is to ensure a well-educated social work profession equipped to promote health, well-being, and justice for all people in a diverse society. Dr. Vakalahi will share insights from her own story, discuss the state of social work education, and explore how CSWE is working to meet its vision. But first, to help me welcome Dr. Vakalahi, I'd like to invite up Fina Rambuka Conklin, one of our first year doctoral students. Fina grew up in Fiji and earned her BSW from BYU Hawaii and moved to Utah, where she earned her MSW from the U and is now in our PhD program. Her research is focused on trauma-informed care and early childhood education. Fina, please, welcome. This lay presentation is a traditional custom well practiced in the South Pacific. We present a lay to show our gratitude, our love, and our appreciation for their time, the honored, the honored guest is with us in this space. This is typically done during a welcoming ceremony or a farewell. So with that, Dr. Vakalahi, on behalf of all of the students in the BSW program, MSW program, PhD program, staffs and faculties, we want to present this late to welcome you back to your alma mater here at the University of Utah's College of Social Work. Thank you, Finau. Like Finau, Dr. Vakalahi attended BYU Hawaii, where she earned her bachelor's degree in business management. Then she earned her MSW from the University of Hawaii Manoa, and both a master's in education and a PhD in social work here at the University of Utah. Her eclectic educational background has informed her leadership, scholarship, teaching, and service throughout her career. Prior to assuming leadership at CSWE, Dr. Vakalahi was professor and dean of the College of Health and Society at Hawaii Pacific University, where she oversaw the disciplines of social work, public health, nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and the physician assistant program. She also served as professor and associate dean of the School of Social Work at Morgan State University, associate professor and MSW director at George Mason University, lecturer and BSW coordinator at San Francisco State University, assistant professor and department chair at BYU Hawaii, and assistant professor at New Mexico State University. You could say that she truly has an international impact. Her areas of teaching include social policy, human behavior in the social environment, and organizational leadership. Her academic scholarship focuses on Pacific Islander culture and community and women of color in higher education. In addition to CSWE, Dr. Vakalahi has served at various professional organizations, including the National Association of Social Workers, her Pacific Islander community, and in communities in which she has lived and worked. Following her presentation, Dr. Vakalahi will have about 30 minutes to respond to audience questions. 
We invite our in-person attendees to write your questions on the cards that are located at your tables, and for those of you online, to submit your questions through the Q&A function in the Zoom window. And with that, Dr. Vakalaki, it is my pleasure to welcome you. I think you can hear me. Let me see if I turn that on. Okay, you cannot hear me. All right, malo elele and aloha. Happy Social Work Month. Uh, March is filled with all kinds of social work stuff, so I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. I'm truly honored to be a part of this Grand Challenge series. Uh, thank you, Dean Osteen and the team for your kindness, for your generosity of spirit. I, I talk about class act, really. Um, this, is, this is truly, truly an honor for me. Um, you know, as, a, as an alumni of this place, um, I think as the Dean was reading off the many places that I've been, I wanna make sure that you all know that this is where it started because that PhD was my badge was my, that is, that was my wings to just go to basically any space that my heart wanted to contribute in some small way. So thank you, thank you for being here. I also wanna follow up on the Dean's um, acknowledgement of this land as a grand challenge in its own right, and perhaps one of the most consequential responsibility of social work education is the acknowledgement of this land of indigenous peoples. So I acknowledge the first peoples of this land with deep gratitude for my space on it. I acknowledge spe specifically the indigenous peoples here in Salt Lake City, the Ute, Paiute, Goshute, and Shoshone nations. You know, our history is a bittersweet one, but it's still our history, right? We will acknowledge it and do better by it. If we really believe in Sankofa though, that Sankofa moment to promote our, I guess, collectivity and inclusivity, I really believe that the future is bright. So despite our history, or maybe because of our history, the Sankofa moment will give us that. So our promise as social work education is to people and place, a promise to acquire the best education, training, qualification, and credential in order to promote and facilitate health and well-being of people and place. Framing this promise are both challenges and opportunities. We've had some really rough couple of years, as you all know and probably experienced and probably still, still working on it. Um, but there has been an abundance of opportunities for social work education to contribute to hope, recovery, and restoration. These big challenges reflected in the grand challenges frame the promise of social work education. It is basically our why. So lean into it. A picture is worth a thousand words, as you can see in this. We're grappling with some really huge issues like food security, health equity, access to a good education, economic stability, environmental justice, student mental health crises. But opportunities are also abound in social work education. So we can train futurists. We revamped our CSWB Features Task Force to look at the futures of social work education with the renowned Dr. Laura Neeson, Dr. Yanisia Dyson, and Dr. Stacy Baraski. So we're really going to do some work on an observatory for social work education in the future. We can also leverage our global co connections the International Associations of Schools of Social Work, they have global competencies, we can leverage that. We can leverage what social work bring to the table for the students in here. You know that nobody does this better. Person in environment, strengths perspective, community engagement, systems thinking. Nobody does that better than social work. So that is a promise we can leverage. We can also leverage our leadership in interprofessional education. We're at these tables. We just need to make sure that we speak up and stand up. So you get the point, right? You get the point of framing the promise of social work education. 
A big part of our responsibility as the educational enterprise is the pipeline and pathway into universities, as faculty in particular. These are overall numbers in academia. Yep, the pipeline is leaking. It has been leaking, but there's also opportunities to help with that. Specific to social work education's responsibility. The promise of social work education is not abstract. It's not mysterious. Some people might think it's, it, it, it's not. It is actually clear, it is bold, and it's consequential. CSWE as the organizing mechanism that houses social work education has a promise of a vision and a mission, strategic goals, and I have added my vision priorities. We use these as our parameters and measurement sticks to actualize the promise of social work education. There is a need to re-educate the public though about social work education. As you can see here, um, social work is a public good. That's a value proposition of social work. We have competency-based education. We are multidimensional when it comes to curriculum. Uh, we're experts on many, many, many things. And our areas of social work runs from education to research to policy and leadership. The topics we deal with is A to Z, basically. Um, but I also wanna point out so that you know your Council, that is your organization as members of accredited social work programs. We are the premier national organization for social work education. We have 900 plus accredited social work programs. That's from Guam and Hawaii to across the continental US to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, That's pretty big. We have about 555 BSW programs, 355 MSW, 35 DSW, and 125 PhD. I don't know if that math is correct, but anyway, it's 900 and plus, okay? We have about 220 HBCUs, TCUs, and MSIs. I can tell you the numbers for the TCUs is three. So you can minus that from the 20 to 220, and you know the rest. Um, about 200 private colleges and universities. I only knew that because I had the opportunity to attend NICU and they were trying to figure out how many social work programs were actually part of NICU. That is the National uh, Association uh, for Private Colleges and Universities. Um, we have the International Social Work Degree Certification, ICE Address. And we also have this new membership structure that includes students. Previously, back in the day, we, we were members of CSWE, but we also, almost always went to the APM, the annual conference. So um, focusing in on CSWE, uh, they do say that you build an organization not with money, but with people, right? We, we all believe that. So this is our people, These, this is my bosses, okay? This is, the, this is the board of directors, the national board of directors for CSWE. We have two students that we're so, so proud of that sit on the board. So that is something that we hopefully will continue to make headways. My comrades, this is the, the promise of social work education is also embodied in the CSWE team who are committed to advancing social work education day in and day out. So I, I call them my comrades in this. Our national membership platform also reflects the promise of social work education. Stretch your sight, yeah, stretch your sight. It's a national platform. The late Dr. Mitt Joyner in one of our last meetings before she transitioned out of this life, urged all of us in the sister social work organizations to level up our sight, set our sights on something higher. She said, stop focusing on the crumbs, okay? Stop being crabs in a bucket. It is exhausting. And ask yourselves, what are you doing for justice for the people? That higher level of thinking and doing. For instance, looking at this national platform, what grand challenge do we need to leverage to forward the promise of social work for anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion? What do you see as a grand challenge for ADEI in this particular landscape of a national platform? So note to yourself and pursue that. If you got an idea, note to self and pursue that. 
let me know. I can help you with that. As a national platform for social work education, the Journal of Social Work Education and CSW Press are catalysts for the creation, dissemination, and consumption of knowledge and what we contribute to the classroom and field, research, policy practice, thought leadership, knowledge that is truly powerful. Again, do you see a grand challenge that you can utilize to actualize the promise of social work education here? Again, note to self and pursue it. As an annual culminating experience of social work education, we hold the annual program meeting, APM, to provide spaces for knowledge consumption, dissemination, and creation. Question to you again, what do you see as a grand challenge that you can use to actualize the promise of social work education? Note to self and pursue it. These are some of the big ticket items that CSWE had made good on our promise in social work education. As I indicated earlier, the membership structure now includes students, faculty, staff, administrators, which reflects uh, commitment to students and all of the team members. The Board of Accreditation was recently launched this past year to reflect the centrality of accreditation in CSWE. We have a student summit. Last year we started, and this year we're gonna have it in May. The Minority Fellowship Program, it is 50 years old, and I'm a proud fellow from University of Utah. So that, that's pretty awesome. The CSW Press and Journal of Social Work Education, they are truly the primary publication mechanisms to get word out to our membership. We're at the table, multiple, multiple tables, okay, within social work as, as well as externally. So these are just some examples of spaces that CSWE is at, speaking up on behalf of social work education as well as the community. I was truly honored to represent CSWE in the tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. this year in Atlanta, Georgia. You know, we cannot expect anything from a promise that we're not willing to contribute to. And this principle of intelligence plus character, that is social work education at its finest right? Caliber and intelligence, both things. Speaking of intelligence and character, I didn't ask for their permission to put this up, but I just put it up anyway. Because these are individuals who are pioneers and who are giants whose shoulders all of us stand. The University of Utah College of Social Work is celebrating 87 years of social work education, if I have that correct. Um, Last month, I had the opportunity to celebrate with uh, North Carolina State. They have their 50th uh, year of having social work education in that university, which implies that a promise of social work education was made and has been kept for 87 years. I think I got that right. It's 87 years that you now must keep and sustain for the next 8,700 years. Aaron Van Vuren said, there will be very painful moments in your life that will change you. Let them make you stronger, smarter, and kinder, but don't you go and become someone that you're not. Cry, scream if you have to, then straighten up that crown and keep moving. That's my contribution to that 87 years of promise. I pretty much said, you know what, there's gonna be some rough times, but we're gonna be okay because we're representing the University of Utah. Think about it, what's yours? Uh, Dan and Marge Edwards, they spoke up for me and for so many of us students who were here. So did Catherine Bry Lawson, Jeff, Je uh, Fred Jansen, Joanne Yaffe, who is here as well, Steve Harrison, Lynn Duran, Ross Van Vliet, Jeff Jansen, the list goes on of people who actually invested in all of us while students here. I never forgot, I just made sure that that return on investment is at the highest level. So let me tell you a little bit about that return on investment. To fully describe the return on investment, let's give credit where credit is due. 
This is my roots and my wings. My name, Halai Valu Fonova Inga of Hengawe Vakalahi. That is the mana of my ancestors. Tonga Eiki, Hawaii, Washington, D.C., those are the locations that I have tried my best to at least contribute in some small way. Mom and dad, dreamers, my siblings. But as you can see in the siblings, everybody's got cap and gown, but you know who holds the power? The woman, the little woman with the moo moo on. Okay? She's the one that holds the power. My heart and soul, this is my kid, Kolohe, 16 year old. We don't really know what to do with teenagers these days. Credit where credit is due. A deep gratitude to the college for giving me a chance. All of my faculty, fellow students, across discipline friends, malo aupito from the bottom of my heart. These are the return and investment of time, talent, and treasure in me as a student. I think I've answered the legitimacy question. Yeah. Tenured full professor, a dean, um, and the list goes on in terms of people giving me the opportunity. Not necessarily have anything to do with me, but people giving me the opportunity. And when they gave those opportunities, I never took it for granted. But guess why? Because the people that I just showed, the previous one, my roots and wings, they never let me, they never let me take, not take advantage of an opportunity. So one of my uh, friends, uh, an attorney, this is what he said to me. Don't love, don't hate, just answer the question, Balu. So I think I have answered the legitimacy question in this case. Part of the return on investment is expanding our reach and impact. So representation matters. Dr. Billy Allen, Dr. Hillary Weaver, and I were brought together because this is the first time we've had three indigenous women in these positions in social work education. So. Representation matters in continuous training. The AGB Leadership Institute was a formal training and a mentorship program that exposed me to external spaces. It prepared me actually for this, for this job of president and CEO of CSWE. I crossed paths with two extraordinary university presidents who have become mentors to me. These individuals who are coaches plus my executive coach. If you have an opportunity to get an executive coach, get one. They're pretty awesome. Representation in being at the matters in being at the table with other disciplinary leaders as well. This is the fashion group brought together as leaders of all health professions associations. And it gave me great opportunities for mentorship. Um, I will forever be grateful to them. In terms of the three pillars of academia, research, scholarship, teaching, mentorship, and service, I wanna share just a few outcomes of the return on, on investment. So the return on investment on the training in research and scholarship at the University of Utah and the Minority Fellowship Program, here are some of the outcomes. So I've had the opportunity or the honor to author, co-author, peer review articles, books, these are some examples of it. And then we co-founded and co-edited Urban Social Work as a journal. This is with Morgan State University, Lehman College, New York Community Trust, who, who funded us, and Springer Publishing. So power of the pen. It is your sustainability plan for those of you who are in academia. I think a proud moment for all of us at Hawaii Pacific University and, and Morgan State University as our partners, um, NIH and IGMS funded us to run a Hui Student Research Center and a Hui Scholars for faculty. It's a, an entrepreneurial research um, project in biomedical and health sciences. And the point was to uh, train undergraduate students across the disciplines in health and biomedical research. So a huge shout out to Dr. Scott Okamoto, David Horgan, Nak Fan, Kelsey Okamura, and Blaise Kalmadule. In addition to focusing on developing students in research and scholarship, I also focus on developing faculty in research and scholarship. 
Um, uh, we, we run uh, Manawahine writing circles, uh, multiple writing circles, and uh, I think we've been doing it for probably about 15 years. We created a scholars initiative designed to mobilize a collective mentorship and scholarship culture. Uh, we had writers and reviewers circle, intellectual space, writing retreats, which we really love, um, some boot camps, mentorship with tenure, tenure track faculty, and uh, we used to do a 30-day challenge where you actually write and submit an article in 30 days. The secret is to find the one that's almost finished. You know? that, that's the secret. So pat yourself in the back in terms of, I did it. In terms of area number two of teaching and mentorship, training at the University of Utah prepared me for my passion for teaching, uh, social policy, HPSE, organizational leadership and writing and research. I am a very proud product of the Minority Fellowship Program and the University of Utah Presidential Scholarship. Um, so I'm really, really deeply grateful for that. And these are some of the young women that I'm mentoring in the PhD program. Um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, right? We're like 0.0001%, I think right now. You just wait and see. We got some that's coming up. So I'm really, really excited for them. In area number three, in terms of service and community engagement, my experience here at the U solidified my commitment to service and community, particularly to ADEI and my own Pacific Islander community and all the communities that I've lived. As you can see, um, and as the Dean uh, indicated earlier, from New Mexico to Hawaii, to Maryland, to Virginia, to it, it is not that I didn't know what I was doing. I had some direction. It's just that as a Pacific Islander woman, uh, one of very few, when an opportunity came up, that's kuleana. It's a responsibility. You go for it when an opportunity came up. So return to the backbone, we all know is community. I am deeply committed to opportunities for university and community partnerships that promote being at the table and advocating for inclusion of community voice in education and research. Service and community engagement can foster connections and relationships, which is our currency, right? That is our currency. Relationships that lead to healthy community, which has been at the core of my commitment throughout my career. So I end with a futures question of where do we go from here? Uh, for me, it stems from my four priorities as president and CEO. So it could be as simple as making a to-do list or more complex as making a to-be list. It could be both. And that's a question for you to answer. For my to-be list, to you who question whether you belong in academia or any place of power or influence, here's my message to you. It's actually from the movie Moana. So I'm gonna have some assistant to come and show you that clip and then I'll wrap up. Let her come to me. I 
not define you this is not who you are you know who you are who you truly Chicken lives. I'm sorry about your hook. Well, hook, no hook. I'm Maui. <laughs> so I repeat to you who question whether you belong in academia or any place of power influence that is my message it's going to be rough at times and um, it might make you uh, unkind and hard but I think if you reach back to your backbone, who you really are. I think you're gonna be fine. That has been my journey in academia. And no more apologies for who I am. No more allowing negativity into my life. Like Martin Luther King Jr. said, I decided to choose love. Hate is way too great of a burden to bear. So thank you, University of Utah College of Social Work. for investing in me and honoring the return on investment. I am Halai Valu Punungabainga Ofaingawe Pakalahi, and I am the promise of social work education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vakalahi. We are going to transition to Q&A, so please come join me. So we'll do as many questions as we can. For those of you in person, please make sure you write questions down on those cards and we will come around and collect those. And for those of you online, please uh, put those in the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom window. May I um, just say one thing? I have family here. Um, can I have my, my nephews? Can you please stand up? Saya and Mona. Uh, so they saw me struggling getting the PhD, so they decided to go get their own PhDs. So their PhDs. My brother, T, is in the back. Please, T, and his wonderful, beautiful wife. And the other brother, Lepi and Sarah, thank you for being here. They were here when I was defending my PhD, and so they gave me a hard time the entire time. They even gave me a hard time when I came. They were like, 
you need to dye your hair, you're getting gray. You know, that's brothers for you. So anyway, they live here in Utah and I, hopefully they make some good contribution to the community. Did I miss anybody else? Line, Line, MSW, by the way, MSW, not from Utah, but you know, BYU down the road. But anyway, we'll hold that against you. Thank social you. worker is a social worker, no matter where you went to school. <laughs> so thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing your family with us today. Um, we really appreciate that um, and that you were able to come and join us so much to honor your incredible work. Uh, you know, it, Disney makes me cry a little bit too. And Moana is, is such a beautiful story. So I always say that, that tears are when the body just can't control the emotion anymore. It's happiness overflowing sometimes. So let me just start by saying how much I appreciate you beginning with a message of hope and optimism. Uh, for many of us, you know, recently here in Utah, these feel like dark days. Um, and in the ending, know who you are, I think is also a valuable message when we struggle with other people trying to define who we are. Um, and sometimes in the face of that, it, it looks daunting to stand up. So... You know, one of the things that I learned from, we, we were in conversation with the board, a board of directors for CSWE. And um, we were talking about identity. And we all, we have a tendency to say that social work, we don't know who we are. When in actual, actuality, we actually do know who we are. And one of the um, board members said, I beg to differ. I know who I am. I'm a social worker. So we have to stop that narrative of people saying, we don't know who we are, you know, we, we, we do this and yes, that's right. That's who we are. We do from A to Z. So I think the, the first thing is for social work is to embrace that, whatever that definition is, whatever the definition is. Now that is connected to hope in a sense um, it's a choice that we make. I mean, I'm just going to get down to that very rudimentary level. It's a choice that we make to either um, accept negativity and accept hopelessness and despair, or we can say, you know what? We're going to try to see the glass half full and see what we can do in terms of that. Here in Utah, I did look up a few things in Utah. You know, your your food security, it's um, the average is about the same as national, about 11%. There's a lot of people, so like a million people with food security. But then you have a very diverse community. Leverage that. Diverse, not only in terms of people, but diverse in interests and expertise. Leverage that. Because I think as, you know, as, as social workers, we, by nature, we look for the issues and the challenges. But I just finished telling you guys that nobody does strengths-based perspective better than we do. So I, I think if we have each one of us just make it a point that we're going to accept um, hope as our, that's our go-to, instead of uh, despair and hopelessness. I, I know that's easy, easier said than done, but I didn't think that that was doable until I became the president of CSWE, over 900 programs. Then I thought, well, I was complaining about some stuff that was like crumbs. Look at the things that everybody's dealing with. But if I continue to preach a message of despair and hopelessness, that's basically what's gonna happen. So change a worldview, change a perspective, leverage that strength perspective that nobody does better than social work. I think that that's, if I'm not answering your question, you can redirect me. Sorry about that. They did not come here to hear me talk. They came here to hear you talk. So I'm here to guide a conversation, not direct it. Um, 
one of the things you also addressed early on in your talk was about the courage to face our challenges head on, right? Um, with abandon even, I might add. And so in places like Utah and other places around the country where we see social movements really that push back on some of our core values. And we do feel disempowered and devalued. And sometimes we, we feel impotent in the moment because we don't know what to do. But I would say that doesn't mean there's not something to do. And, and I just wondered your thoughts about that. Yeah. So we are actually, the educational enterprise is actually one of the most powerful place to be because we're in the beginning, right? So we have people coming in so excited. They want to change the world. So we're there. We're going to need to leverage that more, a little bit more, social work education itself. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't really know if there's any magic potion or magic bullet for, for helping us uh, feel empowered, except, um, like I said, it's going to have to happen one person at a time, collectively, maybe in community as well. And maybe that that's that's where our our site should go. Um, you know, our core values are our core value, values, right? But we're human, so sometimes sometimes our core values don't align with our behavior. Well, tell me, anybody here, your core values align with your behavior all the time, one hundred percent of the time. If you do give us the give give us the magic potion and we're all gonna do that. But but I think I think if it doesn't align, you know, I, I think if it doesn't align, social workers were trained to be flexible, we're trained to find if it doesn't align, what are the options? Um it's hard to listen to the options uh sometimes because uh, the options might not be what you want. So if a core value doesn't align and the option is to let it sit for a minute, that might not sit well with some people. Or the option is ignore it and keep moving. Or the option could be align it and whatever happens, happens. Sometimes that's that's hard to do. However, however, I think if we leverage again, I go back to our skills as social workers, leverage whatever skills that we do better than anybody else. Perhaps those misalignment might not be as bad as we. But but again, like I said, you know that's a. I, I think that that's probably just volume speaking. Um, you're not going to have 100% perfect alignment. It is just life just doesn't happen that way. Um, when I was here at the University of Utah, yeah, life life was not rosy because it's called a PhD for a reason. Okay, so my profs would tell you, yeah, you have to read that one more time, Valu, because you're not understanding it. Well, what is my option? I'm not going to do it. Well, then you have to be okay with the consequences. So the option was always you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. This is the consequences. So I, I'm grateful that as a student here, I learned that to be flexible. If there's a real uh, a realignment that's needed, realign, realign yourself. If not, keep moving, straighten up that crown and keep moving. So hope that made some sense. Is there any water out there? I need some water. Right next to you. Oh, right next to me. Okay. All right. Thank you. So as you take a sip of that, I, I think um, one of our questions is, is related to that. Um, and the way it's phrased is, how can we break out of our hardness as we start to become this way in society? That's a great question. That's a Moana question, right? Yeah. A Tafiti question. So this, I'm, I'm going to just share an experience. So I've been away from Hawaii for about a whole year. So I haven't seen my parents for a whole year. So in February, University of Hawaii School of Medicine invited me to come and do um, an opening plenary to indigenous faculty. I was so proud because I get to talk about CSWE and social work, right? And medical people. Um, so I got there 
first thing I, I, one of my mentees picked me up. First thing I asked her was like, okay, I need some poke, some poi. I mean, all these lists that I have. But first, take me to the ocean. I got to just dip my feet in there. So she took me to Alamana Park. <laughs> There's nowhere else to go. Um, after that, we had the conference. And then I got to see my parents on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. That, how, that's how I shed the hard out exterior. I needed to be home. First, I needed to eat some poke, some good poke, but I needed to be home with my parents who, you know, they're, they're in their age. My mom's going to be 90 this, uh, this year. And um, just listening to their wisdom. Uh, my dad, you know, he, he, he's not coherent sometimes, but I get it. I get it. I listen carefully. I, I can pick from here and there and make the connection. Mom, she just, you need to do this. You need to do that. And now that would take that exterior hardcore away. That was Tafiti talking, by the way. That's my mother. Um, but I think that, that those are things you have to do. For those of us who believe in indigenous healing, do that. For those of us who just need to be in space with friends, do that. If you need a massage, go do that, okay? Social workers, by the way, we're the worst in self-care. But we preach it all the time. And I'm speaking for myself, guilty all the time. I tell my staff, take care of yourself. And they give me like, really? You're gonna tell us that? So take care of yourself. Take care of yourself in the most truest and most indigenous way you can take care of yourself. Indigenous in your own way, not necessarily indigenous in terms of, of ethnic or racial categories, but in your own way. Thank you. So we're gonna shift just a little bit. I think one of the things that's so fascinating about social work is it really prepares you to do almost anything in a career. Um, and specifically, right, we, we have this beautiful continuum from individualized micro practice all the way up to the highest levels of government and policy. So this question comes from a community member um, who is talking about, you know, the need for more community-based social workers and your thoughts about how, how do we support and promote and encourage social workers to see this as a, as a viable, meaningful career path? So the Minority Fellowship Program um, is one way that we have tried to, and it, it actually works for some of us, um, really train and educate people to go back to the community and, and, and contribute in some small way. I, I, I don't know whether there's any grand thing to do with educating people except make it accessible through finances. University of Utah did that to me like double, okay? University Presidential Scholarship in addition to MFP. That's what University of Utah did for me. Um, so, so doing that, making sure that it's accessible in terms of resourcing it, as well as mentoring, as well as making sure that they really get to the finish line, which is the degree. Now, I know social work, BSW, MSW, you know, it's versatile, but when you look at the PhD, or the DSW, and for, for now we have uh, the DSW that's accredited, being accredited. Um, the numbers on diversity just shrinks, okay? So we're gonna have to do better by that. We need to increase those numbers. And I think that that is one really good way of training community-based social workers is to help them get to the highest level of um, academic degree. Now, some of us came into social work education because of community. We, we just came because of community. Now going back to the community uh, then required us to not only find you know, good jobs, but also find ways to mentor new people from the community to come in to get the training or the education in, in, in social work and then go back. Um, but I think the, the core of the question, my, my humble answer to that is you have to resource it well. You have to really resource it well. 
Uh, let, let me just share this. So I was at Morgan State University at the time, and I wanted to um, get some training in NIH to get grants. And I spoke to one of the program officers and I said, you guys are doing so awesome. You have an entire um, track that is for um, underrepresented minorities. And I was so excited and I told him, good for you guys. You guys keep going and, and lobbying for it. And then he said to me, yeah, it, it's, it's really good. We select sixth a year, well resourced. Okay, we have to well resource anything that is community. Otherwise, uh, I mean, otherwise we might as well just say, well, it's versatile, but good luck, you know, in, in spinning the, your degree, however way you're gonna make it. Community work is hard work. We got some community people here who's nodding and saying, yeah, it's hard work, but it requires resources human as well as the monetary resources. Yeah, quick shout out to the community social workers in the room. Thank you so much for that. So this is an online question and probably not a surprise question given the last couple of years that things have been going on. So how does CSWB coordinate and collaborate with ASWB and offices of professional licensure um, around licensure requirements, state compacts, testing, things like that? Great question. So uh, this is the continuum, right? We're CSWE, we're the education lane, ASWB, licensure, and ASW, the profession. So the three entity, we just decided last year to have more conversations with each other rather than guessing what each other is doing to really be at the, at the table together. So we've started that conversation with ASWB and NASW. We have the Social Work Leadership Roundtable where a lot more people are involved in that. NAD is a part of that. SWER is a part of that. NAD is the National Association of Deans and Directors. SWER is a social work. We're so full of acronyms, right? Society of Social Work Research. So all of us are in this together, but we all know that students and graduates really want to know what's going on with licensure. I think as far as I can tell, because we're in the same conversation, we're at the table together, we're probably going to have a lot more options on how to help each other with the workforce than previously guessing what each other is doing. So um, we have a statement that's probably going to come out uh, soon with NAD, with NABSW, National Association of Black Social Workers, with ASWB, NASW, and CSWE, speaking to the importance of the profession. And the profession is legitimized, for lack of a better word, through licensure. You all know, I mean, you ain't gonna get, you, you cannot just go practice as a doctor unless you're licensed or certified. You can't just go and practice as a lawyer unless you actually. So we wanna make sure that it is clear that is the, the licensing piece of social work is a professional piece of social work. Now, passing the exam, now that's a whole different conversation we have to have. Okay? And it's a conversation that we're in community with, with ASWB and ASW. Um, there, there is a, a little bit of rub because CSWE does not have chapters. We are just the national organization. And ASW have chapters. ASWB have, have state level boards. So that, that's a little bit of a rub and, and something that we have to work with. But as far as I'm concerned, hang in there for a little bit while we try to figure this out, um, but know that we're not siloed in the conversation. We're actually in the, at the same table. We disagree on a lot of things. Martel can tell you that. We disagree on a lot of things, but we're at the same table. So it's okay. We know what you're thinking. We know, you know we, at least the things you share that you're thinking. Um, and we can probably grapple with it and as social workers come up with options. So I know that's a, like a round and round way of saying we're working on it. I hope you hang in there with us. 
the circuitous would be my my word for the entire process. Um, so I've got some, I think, almost conflicting thoughts that I, I want to share. So, I mean, we know that uh, social workers who identify as white have the highest passage rates on the current test and that it just drops lower and lower and lower for other social workers who identify by other racial and ethnic groups. So I think a lot of work is being done nationally about how do we how do we change that, right? How do we make it possible for diverse groups of social workers to ensure they're getting licensed so that they can go out and do the work that they've been trained and are incredibly competent and capable of doing, right? So on one hand, I'm a, I'm a big advocate uh, of looking at alternative pathways to licensure. Mm -hmm. So here in the state, the approach that they took was to just say, you don't need to pass an exam to be licensed in Utah. Right. Now, if you want to go outside of Utah, you have to pass an exam. I heard. Right? So that's sort of one approach that we have to think about. And what does that really mean? Um, and in some ways, I think it's it just puts the burden on social work educators to ensure that we are educating the best that we can, right? And that we have practitioners who are monitoring post-graduation doing the best job that they can. The other trend I see, though, um, and I think this could be framed different ways. So I, I'm going to take this from my work in suicide, which is when you're when you're or when you're working with somebody, and some people maybe need C, uh, CPR, right? If they're struggling. Some people need a cardiac surgeon, right. but not everybody needs a cardiac surgeon. So the conversation around, does everybody really need an LCSW to get their needs met? And is there room for the stratification of, of um, uh, skill sets and services? So I'd like to know your thoughts on that, but also coupled with this idea, do we run a risk of um, deregulating social work practice? Right. So... You know, what I, I, I keep thinking about the fact that we already have in the states those various levels of licensure. You have the BSW, MSW. I, I, I think with the MSW, there's LCSW and LISW. Um, I don't know whether th that requires um, grappling with as much as the requirement of helping individuals pass the exam. I know that AS, uh, ASWB have had conversation with us in terms of them really working hard to include people from the academy, academics, in the creation of the, um, of, of the exam. Um, I, I know that they, they're doing their best to make sure that we have diverse voices in the creation of the exam. Um, but we don't have, I don't know whether we have accurate data to tell us that these are the reasons why my community didn't pass or that we, we don't have data. However, we do have, I know that ASWB have funded a couple of projects or, or maybe four projects, I think it's four projects that is specifically looking at licensure Who's passing? Who's not passing? What are the reasons why they're not passing? And it could be multiple things, as you um, had indicated earlier. Um, but I, I, I don't. I would hate for us to make a conclusion that it is one thing or another. We're social work. We're as complex as it comes. And I think that if we are, if we get caught in this is right and this is wrong, instead of like, there's multiple ways, right ways of doing it, that's probably a better option for us to grapple with than the, we're gonna do it this way and we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna uh, budge. So I know that Utah um, has been worried about the workforce. And I think that that's the, that's the bottom line. We have a workforce crisis but I would hate for us to throw away the idea that that workforce has to be qualified, has to be credentialed, has to be, we're social workers. We deal with lives, people's lives day in and day out. And I'm not sure whether that's licensure or just passing the um, accreditation, the e-pass, okay? We're, we're, not, we're not sure. But maybe we are sure in the sense that if Utah's model works, that's a great option. 
Maybe other states might follow that model. I, I, I keep thinking that as social work education in general, we want one thing, one model, and that's the model that we're gonna use instead of saying, no, we got multiple models, we're social work, okay? We got multiple models, and all of those models may work or may not. If it doesn't work, change your direction, redo it. I, I, I don't think that there's any permanent, if this doesn't work, we're doomed. No, if this doesn't work, find another way. That's, that's basically what we train our students to do. This, this way doesn't work, find maybe this other way might work. So, wow, that's a, that's a heavy one. It's a heavy duty one and I, um, it needs further conversation and probably conversation behind um, closed doors where people are basically saying, this are the things that is not working. These are the things that are working. Which one are we gonna start with first? Or in community where you can say, these are the things that's working, these are the things that are not working. I, I, I just think that we, I don't know, I just think that as a, as a social work education, our responsibility is humongous, but we cannot be siloed from ASWB, NASW, NAD, SWER. We, we can't be that siloed and think that the outcomes is going to be good for everybody. So, but yeah. It's a tough one. Good question. So unsurprisingly, there's a lot of love and respect in the room for you. So we're going to return to some of those questions. Uh, this one is, can you please speak to any examples or provide guidance for us on how you and your leadership have invested in people over power? Invested in people over power? That's a good question. I can't separate people and power because people is power power, live with people, right? And as far as I'm concerned, I'd invest in both. I don't think I'd invest in one without the other. Um, empowerment, empowerment is, is something that I try to uh, not only um, embody, but also pass down to people. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with anyone that I haven't said, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have bad habit, but it's a habit that I, I try to make sure that that investment is not just an investment of trying to find scholarship or something for them or write with them, but also imparting, imparting mana or, or, or wisdom, some kind of a wisdom. Um, the, the, the girl set whose picture that I shared, right? Uh, I've known them from Hanabara days. I've known them ever since they were kids. And now they are, um, well, they're still kids, but now they're doing their PhDs. And I think that that's an example for me that is close to my heart of investing in people and power. Don't be afraid of power, social workers. Okay, don't be afraid of power. It's a good thing. You just gotta use it for what it what you suppose what it's meant to be used for. So I, I that um, our writing, our Manawahinu writing circles. So last week Saturday, uh, Friday and Saturday we had. I, I am continuing that even though there is basically no time to do anything except uh, manage CSWE, um, and we got together as a little Manawahinu group. 6 to 10 p.m., we wrote for that much, said goodbye, came back 8 o'clock in the morning, wrote until 12, uh, 11 o'clock, and then we reported out. Uh, those are investment for me is in people with power. So as far as I'm concerned, let's leverage that power, social workers. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are you good for maybe two or three more questions? Absolutely. I like it. Um, so this one, I believe it's from online, it says the intersection of culture, religion, personal lived experience, et cetera, and being a social worker can often be a complicated process to navigate. Can you offer any advice on how to help social work students work through some of the cognitive dissonance they may experience in a program? That's a great question. 
And I don't even know whether I've actually tried to navigate it. I just live it. Who I am is who I am. I am a Pacific Islander woman, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, heterosexual, um, born in Tonga, raised in Hawaii, live here now in the continental U.S., tried and tested here in the continental U.S. I don't know whether it's necessary to navigate every single move you make. I think sometimes it is what it is. And um, like I said at the end, I'm not going to apologize for who I am. No more. No more apologies for who I am. I am who I am. Um, what I will probably do in that sense is make sure that whoever I am is in respect and respectful of who others are. So if I'm in a space where there are people who are different from me, what I need to make sure is that what I live, who I am, doesn't impose or destroy. Maybe that's the better word, destroy. Who, who the other person is or who other people. Um, the question, I mean, I think the person who's asking the question probably has an answer, but just wanted somebody to think outside the box with them. Um, I think the person knows what to do. If they're struggling with a particular part of themselves, we, we have professional social workers who we can go to. We have friends, we have mentors, we have coaches. Um, I have an executive coach that's not a social worker that sometimes I go to when I'm struggling with a particular part of myself. You know, uh, uh, as a woman, sometimes, um, the undermining of a Pacific Islander woman is right in my face, you know, and in public. That's okay. That's okay. We can navigate that. Um, so I have an executive coach who will be the sounding board and will say to me, okay, you, you, that's great that you're doing that. At the same time, um, what are the consequences of embracing that so much, internalizing that so much? Well, I end up missing this and I end up missing that and I end up missing this. So I think that this particular individual and maybe so many individuals are going through that. Uh, I go back to my message of um, don't apologize for who you are. Okay. There is an art and science to that though. Like I just said, um, I'm cool with who I am and I'm not gonna ever destroy another person who is different from me. So there's an art and science to that relationship. It's our currency, but sometimes we don't know, we don't use our currency correctly. Um, so I hope that that answered the person's question. Yeah, so I can't remember the author, but one of the first articles I had to read in my PhD program, which was a long time ago, was called The Art of Social Work. And the commentary was not about um, trying to figure out like who you are in a space, but how you are in a space. Yes, absolutely. I think that's it. It's how you are in space because you probably know who you are and you probably don't apologize for that, but how you are in space so that it doesn't become a destructive experience but a great experience, a constructive experience. So thank you. And it doesn't detract from who you are. Absolutely. So this is um, a question comment from a previous presentation I believe you shared. And it is, could you please share a little about your thoughts on being a good ancestor and how it relates to your position? Being a good ancestor, you know, in Pacific culture, we're like ancestors in training because <laughs> we grew up with our grandparents and uh, we're taught from little, from childhood that at some point we're gonna have to take the mantle, the responsibility, especially with uh, birth order. 
fortunately, I'm not the oldest in the family, so I don't really have to worry about a lot of things. But my oldest sister's kids are the two PhDs that I introduced you to. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, they know they got much, much more responsibility than I do. I think that um, the very fact that I have the blessing of being at the Council on Social Work Education in this particular position has given me an opportunity to share my culture, to share um, social work at the intersection of my culture. Uh, so I think that that's being a, a good ancestor. I think being a, a good ancestor uh, in my in my experience have been um, really getting into academia in a place where there's very little of us yet saying, we're gonna be okay because you know what happened? I, I didn't share with you, I have a slide of mentors, all these amazing women. They're not Pacific Islanders. Okay? Those women are white women, black women, Hispanic, Native American women who have helped me be a better ancestor, even though our connection is just social work, it has nothing to do with our communities. So I think for, for me that that's probably the takeaway is if I am going to be a good ancestor, I better be ready to lift while I climb that, that, um, um, I think in, in climbing, not making that route so difficult to the next person, will look at it and say, I, I, I can't do that. And I can tell you, majority of those people who went before me, they're not Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, because we don't have that many of them who are in academia, but they are from communities who really truly believe that they're good ancestors by making sure that I'm a good ancestor. So that's a generational wealth, I guess you can say. So yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, and, and I love the thought about lifting because when we lift people from behind, they're pushing us forward in the same act. So I lied, I have three questions and, and then I, I won't pepper you anymore. Um, so this one is, could you share your experiences, thoughts, um, guidance, around the challenges that women from minority groups may face during their professional and academic life as social workers and how to stay strong, move forward, be successful. Mm. Look for your people, okay? Look for your people. They might not know you, but if you see them, um, engage with them, okay? Look for your people. Sometimes your circle is gonna, is going to change like 10 times a year. Sometimes you have the same circle your entire career. Okay. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I was never shy to go up to a person, introduce myself and say, I need a mentor, like, like right now. I need a mentoring moment, like right now. Never shy about that. You're gonna have to not be shy about asking for help. Okay? Uh, these uh, ethnic minority women, the women of color, the other thing is, um, you know, we can we can say that we can do things, um, but you got to get qualification to do those things. Okay? So get that education. That is the key. Any woman of color who is listening, especially Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, you have to make sure you get that qualification, and that is the education piece of it. I, um, I, I think another thing, so the mentorship piece, of course, you have to do that. Don't be shy about asking people for mentorship. Uh, don't also be shy about uh, making mistakes. Like, I don't think I made any mistakes in the places that I've hopped from one place to another. No mistakes whatsoever, no regrets whatsoever. But I think if I, maybe if I listen a little bit more, I probably would have taken a different route um, and uh, may, maybe somewhere else at this point, not here at the uh, CSWE. But at the same time, don't be afraid of those growth mentality, making those mistakes and, and, um, and asking for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. 
So. Okay, so put your CEO president hat on. What would what do you identify as the top two to three goals of CSW over the next five years? Mm. So my priorities, I have four. The first one is increased visibility of not only CSWE, but social work education, meaning visibility in circles external to, to a social work education, especially. The second is representation, expand representation. We have got to worry about the representation in the workforce. It, it's, it's great that our workforce is growing a little bit, but it's not representative of the people we're serving. So representation, but also representation in, in local, state, and um, national uh, entities. The, the, the third, uh, so visibility represent brand, okay? That could be something that you do on your own, like, like as, as a person, as a social worker, you know, figure out your brand. But for social work education, for CSWE in particular, the brand is anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion in every sense of the word, whether it's people, community, or perspective, okay? That is the brand. And I know that people say that social work is bigger than that. Yes, it is, but if you think about it, if we're inclusive, okay, yeah, social work is everywhere. If we're diverse, it's not talking about a particular group of people, it's talking about perspective. So I, I want to put that out as like as an example of this is the brand. Okay? Of course, there's other things in that brand. And then of course, my fourth one is organizational sustainability. Um, yeah, you know, um, Money does really talk. I don't care what people say, okay? So we're gonna have to figure out how to sustain not just the organization, but the profession itself. And I know there, there's the P4P, that's uh, the pay for placement. There is NASW who is always, I mean, who's always advocating for better pay. There's all of those things that comes with that with uh, with the this organizational sustainability but there is there is a um there is a goal to make sure that we expand resources for students expand resources for faculty and that's the goal i mean how we going when and how we're going to get there that's what we have to figure out but at least the goal is there organizational sustainability so I know they asked for three, but I gave you four. We're going to be checking on you. You got five years. So last question for you. How do you stay positive and hopeful in a world that seems so divided and intent on challenging our humanity? Hmm. I go back to my backbone. You know, that's family, faith, community those things that sustain me. Um, I, I, I don't know whether I've ever told my parents anything like big dreams that they've said, oh, you cannot dream that. My parents would actually be saying, so how are you gonna do it? If you're gonna dream big, how are you gonna do it? So I, I, I think that that from the get go has been a sustaining force for me. Um, positivity, you got to just choose that. If somebody come by you and they're all negative and stuff, be the positive in their negativity. Maybe you change their mind about being so negative about things. That doesn't mean we'd be foolish though. We know we got problems, but it doesn't mean that the problem be such the focus that we forget there's actually solutions to the problem. So it, it, it's, um, I have to say, um, Every single step of the way, whether I'm talking about education or profession or personal, I've had people who, who actually straighten up my crown when I can't straighten it up and say, keep going. Okay? That's probably where the positivity comes from. And then there are just sometimes I'm thinking, you know what? I already said what I said. I can't take that back. I'm going to have to be okay with it. 
and I come back and correct this some other time and talk to people and say, sorry, I said that, but this is the reason why. And then maybe we can readdress it some other time. So even in those times where we're you know, not being positive, um, I have people around who help me reframe and redirect and reimagine something that I totally thought that, you know, is doom and gloom and make it a, a, a more positive experience. But I, I, um, I have to say last, it is opportunities like this when they honor, it's not me, they actually honor the investment, the return on investment, if you think about it. This, this honoring is on the return on investment. So it's not necessarily the person, so it's not necessarily me, but it's like, I was able to do that because of University of Utah. I was able to do this because of University of Utah. Um, so for me, regularly honoring that return on investment, it just brings naturally hope and positivity to people. So thank you for doing that for me. Made my year actually, but it's only March, right? So I'm looking for, I mean, that's hard to beat. Um, it, it reminds me of the meme, and if y'all will forgive me for this, I've seen it in many contexts, but it says a true queen will help you straighten your crown, not tell other people it's crooked. So on behalf of the students and the staff and the faculty and everyone that's here today and online, it has been a privilege to share this time with you. And, uh, and I invite everyone just to acknowledge this incredible woman, her incredible story and the impact that she has made in it. I have never been more proud to be a part of an institution that has supported you in this journey. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just share one last thing? So at CSWE, uh, Julia Watkins was the president CEO previously. Guess what her alma mater is? University of Utah. So. Go Utes. Sorry, BYU people who are my family who are here. <laughs> but Julia Watkins, I want to give a shout out to her because she's a product also of the University of Utah. So thank you. So a quick reminder for those of you who are doing CEUs, please make sure you check out uh, at the table back there. I do encourage you to check out the um, College of Social Works um, calendar online for our many other events, including our Big IDAS or Big Ideas and Social Work podcast. And with that, I wish you a great afternoon and hope that you will go out and be kind and be well and be safe. Thank you very much.